one, two, three, four. Uh, this is tape number six, Doolittle Graders Reunion, 1978, Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, Trav, I think probably the first question I've, I've asked this just about to everyone, what was your first impression of the first Chinese people you ran into well, when you were over there? The, the first ones that we ran into was uh, um, some women and children in a uh, farm uh, house because we had gone in there to get some food. We'd been with that, we'd been trying to evade the Japanese in that territory uh, for a week, and uh, of course I had crash landed my airplane, and we were trying to. We knew it was Japanese occupied territory, so we was trying to avoid the Japs. So we tried to travel at night and sleep in the daytime, hidden out. And the, the, the people that we ran into, uh, we walked into this uh, little. Uh, well, we, let's just call it a farmhouse. Quite different from ours, of course, but we uh, had some loose coins and uh, pockets, and I'd collected those from the guys that in my crew. We were all together. And uh, I said, let's show them some coins, and uh, not that they want the coins or anything, but it'll show good faith, because we have to use sign language. So with sign language, we held out the coins in our hands to these people, because obviously the women were quite frightened. You know, the men were in the fields working, apparently. And uh, the, uh, the others were just children there. And we made sign language we wanted food. And of course, uh, they got the hint right away and probably had heard maybe by the grapevine that uh, there were some downed aviators in the area. I'm not sure of that because we couldn't really talk to any of these people, but they were frightened of us, but they were uh, immediately uh, very compliant with our uh, request to, for food and something to drink. And so they, they fixed hot tea, first clean water or sanitized water because we'd been drinking out of the rice paddies up to that time which was a pretty uh, dangerous thing to do, but we had no choice. And the first food we'd gotten, and they fed us bamboo shoots and uh, rice and hot tea. And that was really quite a meal for us. And, and so the impression, to answer your question, was that they were extremely friendly and very helpful to us. These were Ch Chinese peasants. When, uh, <coughs> when you decided to uh, crash land your plane, uh, did you make a crew decision, or did I guess it was a crude, well, no question about a crew decision because my uh, uh, instructions to the rest of the crew uh, is that we came up on the coast of China. Uh, the tanks were reading empty and the red light was burning. We were out of fuel. And we'd been coming in under the bad weather. So we were right down at, on sea level, uh, right on the, above the white caps at about uh, 100 feet or so. So uh, under the overcast. And I knew I had to climb up, get a little altitude. And because the mountains rise up rather rapidly right along the coast, so when we hit the coast and identified it, we had to climb, and it could still, it, I got there just as it was getting dark. That was number two, and it was easy to see the coast. It was still just a little bit of daylight. And I started to climb. The minute it did, the engines quit because the tanks were so empty that it uncovered the last few drops of gas, and they rolled to the back of the tank, and of course uh, the engines quit. And I pushed the engines and the airplane level again, it started running again. So we tried to climb, and we couldn't, except that I had gained in the meantime about uh, 700 feet of altitude. And so I said, well, this is enough altitude to bail out, so you better bail out right now. And I think it was uh, right near the engineer gunner that uh, suggested this. Lieutenant, he said, why don't we just all stick together? This is Japanese territory. So since it's occupied territory, well, why don't we just see this thing out together? Why don't you land it down there on the beach or in this, uh, on that big mud flat down there? And I said, well, I can put it in that mud flat, all right. And uh, so as I circled with the airplane flying in a flat position, we just came alongside the mountain and there was a big rice paddy that was running parallel along the edge of the mountain, very straight. And I said, well, this will give us a better chance to escape here than even if we go down on the coast, uh, for, right on the beach. So I said, if this thing will keep flying for one more turn while well, I'll put it into this rice paddy, and that's exactly what we did. So I guess it was a crew decision to stay together rather than bail out. Did, uh, did you have any idea where you were at once you put it down? Uh, we knew we were south of Shanghai. We thought we were coming in on the coast about where our, uh, we'd plotted to, uh, to come into the coast. It was very difficult for Wilder, the navigator, to navigate because we were under an overcast and flying so low over the water, he really didn't have proper navigational references to do us any good. Of course, we had no radio aids, so it was sort of a, a guesstimate of where we were, but we thought we were uh, 
oh, about 150 miles south of Shanghai at the time, and it proved that we were pretty much in that area. When I was talking to Davey, he said, uh, when you took off from the Hornet, all of you knew you didn't have enough fuel to make China. Well, that's right. But you got the 25, 30 knot wind. Uh, by the grace of God, that's the thing that saved us. Is, uh, we, get, we had the tail end all the way from Tokyo, all the way across the uh, uh, sea, uh, from south of Japan to China. Did and you, if it hadn't been for that tailwind, we'd have gone down in the sea. Did you have your thoughts, though, as, you know, as you went into Tokyo, that when we get out of here, we're going to end up in the ocean somewhere? Yes, we were pretty sure that we were going to be short, but uh, we were pretty well committed to do what we were going to do. and. Uh, it was just a matter of carrying it out to the best of our ability, and what, come what may, why then we were going to try to cope with it as best we could. And in fact, uh, along those lines, uh, my navigator drew up a couple of uh, a little uh, American flags on the way across the area to, in case we did uh, reach the mainland or if we were picked up in the lifeboat, we still had a, a life raft aboard the aircraft. And we, our plan was that we would ditch the airplane on the sea and get in that life raft and hopefully we would uh, drift into an island or drift into the coast of China if we were close enough. And so in the meantime he also looked at which way the sea currents were supposed to be running and, and the wind. Hopefully that it would be a break for us if we did go down at sea, but we got a better break than that. We got that tailwind that Davey told you about and we actually made the coast. When, uh, when you came into Tokyo you were number two plane. Yes. Uh, was there any and the general went in on the first one was were your thoughts were that they'd be alert to your coming because one plane had already went in or uh yes uh we really didn't couldn't very well stick around because of the lack of fuel to wait for the others to all go in as a, a squadron so to speak as a, as a flight of 16 aircraft and we were going in we did go in individually but um, and we felt that uh, we'd get them stirred up and it would be tougher on the ones behind us really but, uh, uh, of course, being one of the very first ones, uh, they just didn't recognize us. We came in at uh, treetop level. And, of course, coming across the peninsula that makes Tokyo Bay from the east, that peninsula is quite wide before you get to Tokyo Bay. And, and uh, all the way across that peninsula, the uh, people waved at us. They didn't recognize it as American airplanes. Uh, we were flying so low, a few of them uh, got excited and ran their bicycles off the road and ran in the the ditch, but they didn't. I don't think any of them really realized it was American airplanes. The first uh, shots of uh, uh, our indication that we were recognized as enemy aircraft was after we had bombed Tokyo, as far as I could tell. And then I saw uh, artillery shells breaking in the streets mm -hmm. where they were firing at us. Uh, but we were flying so low that the guns were on higher elevations in many instances, and they were actually had to shoot at uh, less than zero elevation to shoot at us. And so they did some damage, I'm sure with their artillery fire, their anti-aircraft fire at zero level right into the streets. They did their own, a lot of their own damage. Yes, of course they never wanted to admit that and never did, but we were mighty happy to take any credit we could get for any damage that was done, so there was no problem there. Did you run into Father Glenn then? Uh, no, no. Uh, 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 my crew didn't uh, run into Father Glenn. Uh, we uh, uh, were picked up by uh, Tung Xing Lu, a Chinese gentleman that was uh, student aeronautical engineer out of China, I mean out of Shanghai, and he was making his way uh, away from the Japanese also, disguised as a Chinese merchant. And he heard we were in the area, and he was the only one in the area that he knew that could speak any English whatsoever, which he had learned in school and studied engineering. And uh, so he waited for us and uh, made a, a special effort to get to us. And t when I say that, I'm talking about my own individual crew of five. And he uh, got with us and helped us, and uh, I consider that he probably saved my life and that of my crew because uh, there was a good chance we would have stumbled around and got into the hands of the Japanese. If we had, then of course that would have been my name for sure. Not, you know, no, he's an other. honorary member, right? Yes, Tung Ching Lu is an honorary member. He later made his way to the United States and, and uh, uh, became a, with a, uh, well, I was asked to uh, vouch for him, and, uh, or, or at least as a reference, uh, you know. And of course, you can imagine uh, what I had to say to the State Department about his coming to the country. Uh, so pleased to have him here, and uh, he's a real fine patriotic gentleman, and he did get his citizenship, uh, finished his engineering degree in this country, and then uh, became an aeronautical engineer with the, on the C-5A. It was one of his last projects with, as a 
civil service employee in the United States Air Force at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. How, <coughs> how long did it take you from the time you landed until you got to a position where you felt you were relatively safe? I don't recall the exact number of days, and I didn't keep a diary, but as best I can recall, it was about 10 days before I felt that we were out of the clutches of the Japanese, because uh, after we got with Tungshin, it could have been as much as two weeks before we were actually outside of the occupied area. Now, after you left They chased us after that with the uh, uh, aircraft that tried to catch the convoys and try to catch the groups as we moved through into China, trying to make our way to Chongqing, but uh, you felt pretty safe once you was out of actually where they were occupying the territory. You didn't have any, when you left Tokyo, none of the crews had radio contact with any of the other crews? No. We maintained radio silence all the way. I saw the general's airplane and followed him out uh, from Tokyo. I happened to see him again in Tokyo Bay. And, uh, I followed him for, I guess, uh, for almost, a, could see him almost all the way to China, his aircraft, but, but we kept our distance because we didn't have the fuel to fly formation, of course. So. You didn't, you didn't see him when he bailed out or where they went or you knew no. they were up ahead of you somewhere and that yeah, was all. Uh, that's all. I, did, I didn't know when he climbed. Uh, he climbed earlier than I did so he had the fuel to climb with his aircraft and that was good. If I had climbed sooner I would have probably gone on into China and bailed out also but I stayed low so long to maintain contact to try to locate the coast to find out where we were that my aircraft was empty of fuel when I tried to climb and couldn't. And so then I had no choice but to either just bail out right there, which we could have done if the altitude we had, or we could have crash landed as the choice was made, and that's what we did, put it into the rice pad. The uh, crews kind of landed some close to each other and some 50, 60, 70 miles away, or you were really scattered out? They were scattered over a pretty good area. I don't know uh, how many miles in, in an area this would actually cover, but it was it was carried out pretty good because uh, most of them flew to the tanks ran out. I think one or two felt that they were over the designated area of Chushien, uh where we were supposed to go to with the aircraft, but of course they were above the weather and with no radio aids there was no way to identify their actual position and there was no way to make an approach on instruments in that bad weather so they had to bail out. But it was, some of them I think overflew Chushien just a little bit. We were short. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do with these tapes, uh, I'll duplicate them and we'll...